Welcome to the Bare Essentials of Research for Students. My name is Arangan Lingam. And my name is Atisha Pandya. And today our talk is titled An Introduction to Managing a Research Project. So today we'll be going over the four steps to a successful research project. The first step is the conception of a research question and its associated literature review. The second step is the planning of a research project, including its methods. The third step is the actual doing of a research project. And the final step is the conclusion and dissemination of findings. So the conception of the research question is the single most important step in managing your research project. It lays the foundation for the rest of your project, so it needs to be clear, easy to understand by both you and the audience, and must be very, very succinct and to the point. You should consider a topic that you're interested in and then narrow it down to a specific question. And you should also take time to reflect and revise on the question and improve it if need be. So how do you determine if a question is of good quality? I like to use the following checklist. Is the question interesting? It must be interesting to your audience, your peers, yourself, and your supervisor. And is the question important? So a question may not necessarily be important, even though it's interesting. It must be important in order for your audience to be interested in it. Which leads to the question of will your research project make a positive contribution to the field? Is the question clear and well articulated? This was highlighted in the previous slide. You need to ensure that your question is very easy to understand by both you and your audience to ensure that you eliminate confusion at an early stage. A common stumbling block for students, researchers, and doctors alike is the viability of question. You must consider if your question is doable and whether you have the resources available and the time to actually carry it out. And finally, does your supervisor approve? Your supervisor is very, very important in managing your research project. They're there to guide you and help you and advise you if need be. It's important that you and them are on the same page. So the question. I'm interested in the topic area of smoking and health. Question A, is smoking bad for you? And question B, does long-term smoking contribute to chronic lower back pain in the elderly? These are two questions I've come up with from this topic area. What do you think of these questions, Atisha? Using the question checklist on the previous slide, I would say that question B is an example of a well-phrased research question, whereas question A is not. And this is because when looking at this checklist, question A, it is quite interesting and it is possibly quite important. However, the question is so vague and so broad that it's not easily understood and therefore any responses you get will not be easy to um, statistically evaluate and you won't be able to make a positive contribution with that question. The question is also not very clear and well articulated, so it would cause a lot of confusion with your audience. And finally, is the question doable? Just because of the vagueness of the question, it will be very difficult to successfully carry out a research project based on the question. Whereas Question B remedies a lot of these. Do you agree? Yeah, absolutely. Question B um, highlights the importance of a clear, well-articulated question. And by doing so, it's more doable and the findings will possibly make a positive contribution, unlike question A. And it's quite, uh, quite specific, as in it doesn't leave a whole lot of room for confusion. I mean, as, as we can see with question B, we automatically identify the independent and dependent variables. The independent variable being the long-term long smoking, the dependent variable being the chronic lower back pain, and the population we're studying, which is the elderly. So this is a good example of a well-phrased question that's specific to the point and easy to study. So now that we have a vague idea about the question, the next step is to consider the literature. We want to know what's already been done in the field, and we want to know whether our question is original work or whether we're contributing to an already existing question. It's really important to know the background of the area you're researching, so do a comprehensive literature search. You need to use PubMed, Cochrane Database, Google, NICE, World Health Organization, and look at different articles in the area you're interested in. You should also know who the key players are in the area you're interested in so that you can give credit where credit is due. 
Never take credit for someone else's ideas and always reference your work. So we've conceived our research project to a certain degree. We have our question. We've done a bit of a literature search. The next step is planning the method. And I like to use the following series of questions in order to answer key points about our method. So we want to know who, where, when, how, and what. In terms of who, you need to identify who your population is and whether your sample is representative of the population. You also need to ensure that you're choosing an appropriate sample size to ensure your results are statistically significant. And if need be, you can get in contact with a statistician to aid you on deciding on the number of participants needed to make your project viable. So sample size is a common area that students find challenging. Um, if you don't use a statistician or you end up choosing the, an inappropriate sample size, you may run into one of two problems. You may have a lower number of sample size than is necessary to have a significant result and thus will be unable to contribute positively to your field. On the other hand, you may have too many people in your sample, in which case your results may well be significant and may well let you contribute to your field, but it may end up being particularly costly. You may end up spending a lot more time and resources than was necessary to get the result that you were looking for. So where? This is important in terms of logistics. Where are you recruiting your sample and where are you conducting your study? You also need to consider where you're storing your data and whether these resources are available to you. For example, if you're doing a qualitative study, then where are you going to carry out your focus groups? When is a very important question to consider. Again, this really comes down to the viability of the project. So many students are on a timeline. You may be doing a research project in the summer, maybe for a special study module or with an essay coming up. So it's important to consider whether you can complete your research study and you know, relatively get results to solve your research question in that allocated time. Remember to account for research ethics applications and funding applications because these can end up delaying your project. So do you and your supervisor have enough time, motivation, and interest to carry out the project. Come up with a timeline and try and stick to it as close as possible and keep in contact with your supervisor with regard to where you are in your timeline. So the next thing to consider is the what. What are your independent and dependent variables? Is your data qualitative or quantitative? Is it nominal, ordinal, or interval data? And these are very important in terms of deciding how you're going to statistically analyze your data later on. And the last thing to consider for your methodology is the how. How are you collecting your data? Are you doing it via surveys, interview, looking at patient records? All of these have implications in terms of certain approvals you need to get. For example, certain approvals for accessing patient records. You must look at how you're conducting your study. Are you looking at randomized control trials? Are you planning on doing qualitative assessment using focus groups? And finally, you want to consider how you're analyzing your data, whether this is a statistical analysis using a variety of tests, for example, an independent t-test, or whether you're coding your information if it is qualitative data. Funding is very important, and it's essential that you apply as early as possible to prevent delay in your research project. We're not going to go into a significant amount of detail about funding, but you may join a group where they already have a number of funds for a specific research project. You may also end up having to result in a situation where you need to apply for grants or apply for funding from trusts or even private companies. It's important to declare any conflicts of interest you may have. And what this means is essentially if as an example, is if you're working with a company and uh, the company and you're researching or auditing one of the company's products, declare any conflicts of interest and apply early. Ethics is very important as ethical approval is designed to protect participants, the researcher, the institution, and ensure a high quality of research is carried out. 
human research always requires ethical approval from a local research ethics committee. However, certain special provisions may require other ethical approval. So research on NHS patients or clients requires national research ethics service approval, as well as local hospital research and development approvals. Lab-based or other research may require special approvals, for example, human tissue, stem cells, databases, and military or defense research. Always consult the law on the type of research you're doing as well, especially if you're unfamiliar in the field, and talk to your supervisor because they will be familiar with the project. Ensure that you apply for ethical approval early on as there can be delays in this and this can further delay your research project. The next step is to consider whether you're actually doing research or an audit. And this is also a topic of confusion among students. The research is the discovery of new knowledge, whereas an audit is evaluation of a performance compared to a standard. So an example of research would be the question earlier on on smoking, whereas an audit would be looking at the effectiveness of quit smoking mechanisms. So Again, I'd like to stress that all research with human participants requires ethical approval. However, although not all audit requires ethical approval, certain audits may well do, especially high-risk or sensitive audits. So an example of this may be audits on vulnerable groups, such as children or the elderly, or audits that have sensitive questions, such as asking mothers about miscarriages Basically, any situation where you have an audit with greater risk than that which is experienced in day-to-day -day life, it is probably important that you con consult the ethical local ethical committee uh, to see whether eth ethical approval would be necessary. So we've considered the method stage of our four steps to success, and the next step is what to do. So. Now you need to actually carry out your project. And this is the most exciting part because you finally conceived an idea, you've um, figured out your methods, and now you're actually doing it. What you need to do is ensure that you're flexible with the project. Quite often, when it comes to actually carrying it out, you'll find that you hit a wall and you need to be able to be flexible enough to alter your um, research question or change it so you still get significant results. You need to discuss any changes or difficulties that you have with your supervisor. And you need to ensure that you keep the ethics committee and sponsors up to date if there are any changes. So we've now done our project. We've, uh, we've been successful. We've carried out our question, our methods, and we've analyzed the results. The final step is dissemination of information. Now, I know a lot of students will carry out research projects for special study modules, essays, etc. But it's especially important to disseminate the information you found in order to positively contribute to your field, especially if you've used resources like time and money. And this includes um, looking at different conferences. There are a number of student, local, national, and international conferences where you can talk about your research and get an audience involved in it. You can also contact journals to see if your research is publishable, and even potentially the media if you think it's of interest to the general public. To do this, you should contact your university or hospital media offices for more information. So, in summary, the following are the four steps to success. To conceive a research question and conduct its associated literature review. To plan the research project, including the methods, funding, and ethical approval to do the project, and finally, to conclude and disseminate the findings. Thank you very much for listening to our podcast, and please do let us know if you have any questions.